the last Voc Talk Cafe of 2023. So welcome to the Voc Talk Cafe by Les Cool. This is a place where we chat live about teaching a trade in today's world. This is going to be a fun one today because this is our year-end review. But before we get to that, a little quick reminder on the website uh, the, uh, of Les Applicaux of Vocational Training, you can find all the collaborative and documents uh, uh, and resources on the website. So each article has a web uh, has a web page dedicated to it, where you can see we have the recordings, the summaries, the archives. We have the collaborative document and the resource library, and then of course the um, uh, Google Calendar. That if you just hit the little plus next to the Google, you can subscribe to the calendar and have it pop up in in, in your work calendar. Before that, remember this is a pilot project. Your implications and suggestions are very important because we want this to create this a space for you. So speak up. Everything you have to say is worth listening to. And I'm just going to add a little bracket because I have been spoken to a few times in the last uh, few weeks. You don't need to bring it up here. You can also send us an email or just let us know in person when you see us. We absolutely take that into account. All right. All right, so for our holiday edition, the discussion highlights of 2023. All right, so today's goal, today's goals, we would like to present some key takeaways from our first 12 episodes. We want to want to identify our favorite moments or elements that we've had so far, and we want to sort of discuss some of our ideas, hopes, and crazy wishes for the next episodes. I was going to say the next 12 episodes, but I was like, wait a minute. No, no, I'm not limiting myself. Mm -hmm. This is, what is this? Seven seasons and a movie. This is seven seasons and a movie of Hawk Talk Cafe. <laughs> okay, so the session. So we have the presentation. This one's probably going to be a little bit different, but normally we have the presentation, which is our theme topic that goes for about 15 minutes. Then we have, and this part's recorded, we stop the recording and then we have the interactive session where we discuss some of our, our top, uh, some of our impressions about the topic. We do take notes during that time, but we don't record that. And then we go back to the presentation mode where we're recording and we have the five minute tech capsule where, where Reci presents some tech inspiration on how to integrate that topic into our teaching. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So. Our discussion highlights of 2023. So the way I set this up is like, and I hope you guys are okay with this, but we're going to kind of do a run through a sort of one minute of each topic that we touched on and sort of I'm going to try and summarize it in one minute. Um, and then from there, as I, Mark, you also had your little comments. Did you want to add them at the same time? Do we go one by one? Are you good with that? Let's go, talk go one by one, and, and if I have some anything to add to what you're not mentioning, I'll bring it in, but I'm quite sure there's going to be an overlap, so you we'll go ahead, okay. and if I have anything to add, I'll jump in. Okay, so we're going to kind of spend one to two minutes on each one, and we're going to talk about sort of the overall highlights of it, the summary. Then once we're done with the, those 12, the 12 episodes that we've had, then I'd like to open up the floor, and I'd like to discuss sort of a uh, one of our favorite moments, our, our key elements, what's, what's our personal takes on this? And then from there, then I would say, okay, how do we see this going into the future? What is your vision of this? Like I said, seven seasons in a movie. Is this, you know, Ubisoft coming in and creating the Voc Talk Cafe video game? Like, what is your vision for the future? <laughs> So our first one, this was our, this was our first one this year was metallurgy where we got, James is here. So I'm so glad you're here, James. I'm hoping you're going to pop in and say something on this one. But this one was really interesting because it was all about using augmented reality in training situations. And the one we really focused on was uh, welding. And what was really great about this one is we saw uh, in what James presented is he showed us the tools and he showed us like and, and very specific but he also went after the, the pedagogical imp, imp, uh, implement Im, implications and how this could be pedagogically really beneficial for students on the one for safety because in the beginning not having to have real welding equipment with a serious amount of voltage going through your hand lowers the stress level and really can have the student become familiar with the tools before uh, before actually handing the real one. So uh, from a safety perspective. And then the other thing that was really interesting was all the extra data that you could get that could help your learning 
by what you wouldn't normally get with actually the real welding tools. And James was explaining to us the, the distance, for example, in which the nozzle was from the piece of metal, which as a newbie would be really hard to gauge, but because you're using a digital version of it, you were able to get that information and your learning curve would be a lot, a lot shorter than, than with a regular tool. Um, so that one, metallurgy, I thought that for me was a real eye-opener, was the, the pedagogical side of augmented reality and what that can bring to a student. Uh, how James and Mark? Be, uh, how it can be a great, uh, safe initiation tool at the beginning of the learning curve to understand what's going to happen later, not replacing the reality in any way. Yep. If I may add a piece to that too, I was also commenting on the students that may present some sort of confidence, uh, like a lack of, of initial confidence or, or you know, anxiousness to, to you know, perform certain tasks for a first time. So, uh, for a student new in the program or whatnot, it could be a great tool to initiate them as to what's to come uh, in a very safe space, as as Mark has just mentioned. Yeah. Okay, and then our next, uh, the next of our talk that we had was with uh, the food and tourism sector. So this is the one that's near and dear to Mark and I's heart. <laughs> and this is where we got to talk about project-based learning, um, which is definitely um, a, a tool that's used a lot in professional cooking. And what came out of this, what I would, uh, some of the key elements of this was that the reason why we like, I think, project-based learning is because it, we, it allows us to very easily recreate situations that we would find in the workforce with that idea of you're constantly solving issues. And here I can do it in sort of uh, like a, a more organized way so that this focuses on the learning, but you're allowing that student to really live what it would be like in, in the industry. And I thought that was a key takeaway from, from that one. And then another key takeaway was the whole notion of, and this, like I just realized I said, you set it up and you organize it, but you got to let go. Once it's set up, you got to let go. You got to let them live it. You got to let them make their mistakes. You kind of want to guide the mistakes. You want the mistakes not too far, but you got to let go and let them make their mistakes and let them self-appropriate the results. You know, it won't, it won't be exactly what you envisioned it to be, but it will be something that they created. And you have to, you have to allow them that, that, that right, that, that ability. And I thought that was very humbling because sometimes when we have the notion of project-based learning, we have this vision of what it would look like in the end. It doesn't always look like that, but the power in project-based learning is that the two students self-appropriate it. So that was a key takeaway for me. Mark? I, I concur completely that they get to create something that they think is worth being created, whether it's a finished product, a process, a, a, an organization or whatever the project is about. It gets to be about what their intention is and not about the teachers. It, as you said, humbling, I was going to say that it requires courage because you have to be ready for anything can happen in the next 30 minutes. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's largely compensated by the level of commitment, engagement, and, and, and actual learning that's happening in the students' persons, totally, compared to something that is more directed. I think it's worth it. Okay, let's move on to AI. So this was our big one. This was the one we had the biggest attendance in, like for obvious reasons. But this was in the administration and commerce section. And we kind of, when Mark and I were putting this together, I don't know, we were kind of discussing this and it was like, hey, let's talk about like, you know, we want to know we're aligning what's going on in the industry and like how we're going to do this in school. And yeah, yeah, it'll be good. And the key takeaway for this one for me was the can of worms that we opened up where I don't think I fully realized the scope of what this will mean not just inside society, but inside education, inside a classroom, inside an individual teacher. And so that was a real eye opener. And this one I have to say is probably one of my favorite ones because it made me realize, oh wow, there's tons of avenues that we can go explore 
where we can talk about, okay, why do we talk about disruptiveness as opposed to replacement? Why are we using that vocabulary? Because when you look at AI, that's what we're, everybody's talking about. It's going to be a disruptive thing, but nobody's really talking about it will replace this, which is more vocabulary that we associate with automation. So why are we using that vocabulary? And I thought like, and, and other like other vocabulary that, that was coming out where we were, you know, um, doing the research with the Pew study was it was talking about risk. And I was like, oh, why are we talking about risk? And why are we not talking about this task will be replaced or this task is going to change? It talks about risk instead, which I thought was really interesting. And it sort of set off a chain of thinking in my mind of like, oh, there's way more to explore here because this is a much we just touched the tip of the iceberg. So I thought this, this one was kind of interesting because it was an overview, but I realized there's a giant amount of information to go to sift through here. Uh, Mark? Yeah, AI, no comment. <laughs> like it's, we're, it's, we're gonna see soon how all this unfolds and what real impact it has, it will have. It's gonna be big, but for now, I think it's just speculations. All right. Next one, healthcare. Oh, this is Kelly's. Oh, Kelly. <laughs> so and, this next one. And, and I want to say that it, uh, I, I also made the list of my favorites. And this, this one is the one that was my favorite throughout the whole, the whole 12 episodes. But, <laughs> and I would have said it even if Kelly had not been here. <laughs> okay, so healthcare, we did the power of triangulation. So this one was really interesting because what what I took away from this was, um, and I think it's, it could be good for anyone, but what I really found was that there was a synergy but behind the way the healthcare system works, not the way the healthcare system works, the way we approach healing and, 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 and working inside the healthcare system and this notion of triangulation, where I found that, wow, this is sort of a natural fit between these two. And uh, what I would really like to do, and this is my hope for the future, is I would like to be able to go observe a healthcare teacher at some point in in their classroom to be able to see this this triangulation like live as it's as it's happening because I think that this this is a, a really interesting aspect of being able to go after uh, discussions, being able to go after, uh, uh, artifacts and being able to go after, um, uh, observations, the observations. And, the, and the observations, right? So seeing all those three sort of come together in a natural environment, I think would be fantastic because, um, because of that sort of natural synergy between the two of them. I, it's, I was just going through the acronym of, because <laughs> it, I always use the acronym of COPS, so I remember this conversation, observation, and products. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. a good way to remember it. Mm -hmm. What I thought is that it really brings the, I, in my notes, I wrote evidence-based yeah. teaching. It's so like it's not, and and I think that's why it had such a lasting impact. We didn't mention it. At, during the episode, but it really brings out the aspect of the ethical responsibility position of the instructor of basing our professional judgment and our actions on what's actually going on for real, which is not only res test results and not only finished products from procedures that the students were trying to attempt. We're gathering more evidence and that, that to me, that's super, super important. Like teacher, the relationship, the human relationship between the instructor and the student is vital to the, any learning, but the decisions that the instructors make need to be based on facts and, and that triangulation approach is really bringing, like, these are the facts that like, so it solidifies the whole process. And I like that very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very Kelly, cool. you have anything you want to add since this is your baby? Well, well, just in listening to, to Mark's comments, you know, for me, I, I come from the, the academic side, right? So I taught in elementary school on NCGEP and that's just a natural way of gathering evidence that process is what what we're learning in our teacher training from the beginning so my assumption was that you know, vocational teachers get that as well they understand that process that it's not just the evaluation at the end but that it there's there's a 
theories are, are there are different sources and means of collecting evidence and that it's not just again not just at the end but it's it forms your teaching practice along the way too if you're if you're collecting evidence in in a, an efficient way then you're able to adjust your teaching strategies too because you're following the, the 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 progress of the students does that make sense yeah, yeah 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 and remember this is the one where we said oh wow yeah. And this, why a triangle? Because architecturally, it's the <laughs> most stable form. And it was right. like, oh, stability in teaching as well, you know? <laughs> yeah. And a uh, little side note. So for those of if you, any, if anybody's watching this video afterwards, there's a great video that the, um, uh, uh, the uh, EPC group, the uh, English Pet Consultants made, I think it was EPC or was it with AC? Yeah, what, no, it's like EPC. EPC group made and it's linked in the in the resources uh, on the update cool side. There's a great little six minute video that talks about how to use triangulation in, in education and it's really, really well done. So if anybody's curious more, go ahead and check that video out. Um, okay, next one. So we went back to food and tourism and this time we had a guest. Uh, that came to talk to us about uh, the challenges of, of a certain trades. Because, you know, when you come from, from trades that are popular, I hate to use that expression, but the well-known trades and that they kind of sell themselves, you know, the cooks, the, 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 the pastry the, making, pastry making, yes, the, 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 oh, I don't know, the carpenter, like the, 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 you know, these are well-known, well-established trades that kind of sell themselves. But yet, front of the house is another super well-known super well-established trade but for whatever reason and this is where like this is where sort of questions come in because it seems like really big issues for whatever reason being a, a professional uh host being a professional server somebody who has a professional background in taking care of the front of the house of a restaurant this is not really valued as a trade in our society. And, and it's an area that always struggles to recruit students. And yet we go into the workforce and there's tons of people going to restaurants and lots of servers, but society perceives this as a job you do when you're young. And we don't equate it the same value that we equate uh, other trades. And yet being from the cooking world, I can tell you, <laughs> it is night and day when I work with a professional server. It is, or professional front of the house. Like it is amazing and it's fantastic. And these are people that are absolutely crucial to the restaurant experience. And so having uh, Fred come in and talk about some of the struggles that they have and some of the initiatives they've taken to try and, and, and promote their trade and get new students, um, it, it made me really empathize. And it made me want to somehow contribute on a social level to promoting this, <laughs> to promoting this trade. Um, but all that to highlight that they do come up with some really innovative ways on, to try and, and recruit students. And in this case, he was talking about a project with uh, a local restaurant train to try and train their servers on the job, as well as promote why you would get the training. And so bring them into the centers for specific things. So it, it was, it was, uh, and an innovative way of going about it. Mark, do you have anything? I must admit that many of the episodes that we made lingered in my mind afterwards and like brought some reflection about VT and stuff. And that this one is particularly true because it's it's somewhat of an issue that we have with vocational training as well, that it's seen as a alternative route as a uh, even an easier route for people who don't not and it, uh, who don't succeed well in academics mm -hmm. whereas in fact it's a different route it's a true path in itself and it leads to real satisfying uh, occupations and well remunerated uh, on, on on many occasions as well mm -hmm. so and it's it's there's that issue of the image of the trade really resonated with me because it, it 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 applies to most of vt actually yeah good point okay next one so then we went to beauty care and beauty care the one we jumped on was of course 
influencers. Okay, so we talked about the idea of internet creative culture as professional development in beauty care. And this was definitely, this was a giant rabbit hole that I went down. And I realized it was also because of my, like my misconception as to what creator culture actually is. And this could be generational. It could be just lack of experience because I'm not that well versed in social media. I have a lot of preconceived notions with social media, but this one was really interesting because it brought up this idea that creator culture sees the internet in a different way. Instead of just being a way to consume information, creator culture is about monetizing the internet. It's about I'm going to contribute to the internet, but not an altruistic matter. I'm going to see this as a new way of making money, which I thought was really kind of interesting because it was like, well, that's not at all. <laughs> no, the internet is where you post something online that people click on and purchase. That's how you make money off the internet. And this is, this is a different ball game. And that was, that was a real eye opener for me. So that, that was my major takeaway with that. Mark. You know what? That's the only episode where I didn't write. I don't know. I have nothing to say. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's uh, I think we need to make other episodes about this because we just scratched the surface in that one hour and we need to get back to this. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Moi, moi c'était mon, mon préféré, celui-là. Oh, yeah? Oui, parce que j'ai été surpris qu'on qu le fasse en classe, qu'on qu les forme à ça. Moi, je me disais, c'est la place. Je regarde sur Internet, c'est ça. C'est les traits qui sont sur Internet. C'est des ouais. millions de, de, de vues puis de, 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 de gens qui, qui vont s'abonner à, à, à ces... En tout cas, ce que j'écoute, c'est les traits. Fait que je ouais. me disais, il faut qu'on en parle en classe. Puis la prof qui est venue en parler, elle, elle le faisait. Elle les ouais. formait pour qu'ils soient prêts à l'utiliser, peut-être pas prêt à aller travailler comme coiffeuse non. ou comme, mais prêt à produire du matériel, prêt à faire la différence entre, prêt à pas avoir des attentes ou pas. Donc moi, c'est celui-là qui est venu me chercher. Yeah, that's true. And it's actually a good point you're bringing up that the teacher incorporating that into their class and teaching them how to be, and that goes after that professional development side. And it's a real element of Using the internet as more than just a way to consume information. It, it, it's that it's that hoidagogic, hoidagogic side of the of the internet where I am directing my learning. And my learning is not just about me consuming information. It's about me creating something and I'm learning during that process and I'm contributing. And that's my professional development is, is that process. So it turns the focus towards the process and not necessarily the product, although we see the product. You know, so that one, that one, uh, yeah, that one is also, I'm going to agree with both of you. And I thought that was really interesting that the teacher was in, incorporating that into their, into their learning. Okay. Then we go back to food and tourism. You can see where Mark and I come from, right? <laughs> where, you can get the, the cook out of the kitchen, but you yeah. can't get the kitchen out of the cook. <laughs> <laughs> So we did another food and tourism one, but this time we did have another guest. So that that was lovely. So so Ollie came to talk to us about using digital libraries in education, in, in his teaching, which I thought was really interesting because we always associate cookbooks with hard copies, right? Table books that have beautiful images and recipes. And that's what we always associate cookbooks with. But he was really integrating this idea of like, no, it's a database. And the student can access all kinds of recipes. And what that does is it allows the student to sort of see through the recipe as, a, as, as the final result. And the recipe becomes a tool because you can use it as, 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 as uh, for comparing. And you can use it to, to, uh, to extrapolate and, and, and sort of create something new out of these four combined units. And so I thought that was, that was a really interesting one because it was going after the library more as a data bank than, than, than as what I associate uh, uh, cookbooks with, which is sort of that aesthetic side, right? Or I just look at the pictures. Yeah, yeah, the recipe, but I want to see the nice looking picture. So I thought that was really interesting. That was a, uh, Mark, what do you got for that one? This one, this one is like, as a consultant for the Reci, my my work is to look for ways to make training education better 
from the angle of using technological tools. And 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 this is kind of the the, the grand doors opening. Like this, this fr from one connection, you get access to thousands. Literally, I'm not throwing out numbers of resources that can be used in so many different ways. So it's it's like it's the kid in the candy store for me. This kind of <laughs> tool. Cook in the cookbook store. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, anybody else want to comment? I'm kind of curious, like, if this one is really specific to, and well, as I guess we're moving forward in the future, this one might be very specific to the food world because, like, so much of our upskilling is through cookbooks. Like, that is sort of a natural way for us. And I wonder if other trades have this as well. Like, I'm trying to think, I mean, do auto mechanics have beautiful they coffee do. table books? They don't have and... beautiful coffee table books, but they have beautiful training websites uh, that are yeah. like way more precise and and uh, detailed than any uh, shop manual will ever be. Mm. Okay. Okay. The next one we have was with building and public works. And we talked about sustainability in the construction trade. This is another one of my favorites because this one opened up the door to like, once again, wow, there's whole levels of stuff that I haven't even thought about. For me, sustainability is, oh, okay, can you recycle it? <laughs> and that's what I understand is sustainability, right? And here, this opened up the whole door to the, the, the notion of sustainability is as far as like, contracting out labor to, to materials, to energy resources, to, to, to the actual design of the construction and forming the tradespeople to be able to understand the design so that they're reproducing it in a way that's congruent with the design. So this one is another, is a little bit also like the, the AI one where I was like, and the social media one where I'm like, oh, I just touched the tip of the iceberg here and I'm hoping to do a few more of these in, in, in the future, because I think there's a lot of possibility with this. And how do I, as an instructor, teach sustainability? Is it, it's not as simple as put that piece of paper in the recycling bin. We're now way past that. So how do I incorporate this notion of sustainability into my teaching so that student is prepared? And I'm wondering if like this element is not long overdue, because if I go back to the food world, you know, even when I was in culinary school, it was always told to us, look, eight out of 10 of you are not going to be in this industry in five years. Well, that's not very sustainable to train a bunch of workers that are no longer going to be in this industry five years later. So like, I'm thinking like some of this thought processes about sustainability, how is that going to infiltrate into the other sectors? Like in this case, we were talking about um, the construction world, but I thought, wow, okay, a lot of these, so these contexts would, would, will transfer over to other, other areas. Totally. Uh, Mark? I just want to add that uh, in, in today's context, uh, the, the newer programs will uh, include uh, respecting environmental rules as a règle de vertic, as a pass or a fail vertic. criteria, just yes. as much as a uh, uh, health and safety or something so it's not something that can be dismissed in any way yeah i know i know that uh dan attended this one right carpentry teacher yeah. from cbc and uh he's made several comments in passing to me about oh that was just such a great rock talk i wish i could do this one again so i i know that the topic was uh you t you piqued his interest for sure <laughs> yeah and i actually just saw him today and he's <laughs> like i want to do another one <laughs> so yeah, yeah he knew it you know yeah. and even like even his colleagues kind of chimed in where it was like yeah dan's been talking about that so you can see like there's a resonance with it so that's really cool Right on. Okay, now we go into oh, our labor relations series, our labor relations series, and we can do the, the four of these together. This is sort of fired from the fact that we're all on strike at this point, and that and that and that not just the education world, but the public sector. And this this series came about with the idea of like, well, what do we need to teach our students about labor relations? We talk about CNSSD, we talk to them about worker safety, but are they prepared to go into the workforce as workers and make 
decisions based on does their sector have a union or not? And why would they get a union job or not? Are they able to then go to the union and vote when the union asks them to on something? Do they understand the difference between paid labor and volunteer work? Because volunteerism is a big deal in Canada. It's a value that we have, but not all societies have it. And is there a risk of exploitation there? Because some societies might not be familiar with it. And so might not, if these workers are coming in um, and, and getting trained here, are we training them with the idea that there's some types of labor that it's okay to do as volunteer work and in fact encourage and other types where no, don't do that, that's exploitation. And, and in these four, um, the major thing that, that, that stood out was one in four Canadians is not born in this country. And so with such a large population coming from abroad, is part of the teaching that we have to do, not just how to be safe as far as not get injured, but also part of the teaching we have to do in, uh, in, 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 in the trades is preparing laborers to be able to be part of a workforce and, and give and take and be sustained throughout their entire career. So that I thought was, was, was really quite interesting. Some of those statistics that I was able to pull up. So we ended up doing the four sectors. We did mechanical manufacturing, healthcare, administration and commerce, and, uh, and auto mechanics, so motorized equipment maintenance. Each one was sort of different, different avenues, like different, different relationships to like syndication or unions or historical labor relations. But what really was coming out was the need to prepare our workers to understand the idea that their, their, their labor is monetized and that they have rights in relation to that. And when do you exercise those rights and how? Um, especially given a foreign workforce, but also even our local guys. Like this is, doesn't exclude local people as well. So those are my major takeaways from that. Mark? I agree 100% and, and, and you summarized it very well. So I just want to mentioned just in case anybody's watching this recording later that <laughs> today is not a strike day for us we're not affiliated with the fe so we're not actually on strike as we're doing this we're uh, uh <laughs> i just wanted to mention mention true. this for those not listening to it live <laughs> that's a good point mark <laughs> good okay so okay so those are sort of our highlights of the of the of the four of the twelve um, the key takeaways of the twelve uh, series that we did. I just want to mention too that all the summaries. So each Vok Talk Cafe at the end we do a summary, and that they can be found on vt.proceed.ca. So we have the recordings uh, and the and the minutes of the meeting and the resources that are available on the après cours website underneath the article, but then we also have the summaries that are posted in the groups. And I guess the reason why I wanted to highlight that is that we can, you know, hopefully we can, we've only had 12 episodes so far, but hopefully we can start to see patterns appearing as to for, for, for specific trades and what is piquing everybody's interest. So I just wanted to say that we can, uh, we can always go ahead and take a look at the summaries on the, on, on the vt.proceed.ca group. Okay, so what I want to do now before we go to the key takeaways is I'd like to everybody to, those that wish, I'm not going to force anybody, to talk about sort of their favorite moments. We pulled away the key takeaways and some of us mentioned our favorite episodes, but does anybody have any favorite moments or key elements that they want to bring up? C'est l'animation, en fait, parce que à toutes les semaines, vous êtes là, et à toutes les semaines, pendant la semaine, Robin et Marc, vous faites des recherches pour des sujets souvent que vous ne connaissez pas là, et que vous fouillez. Mais Robin, Marc, il connaît son sujet, là, je l'espère. Mais Robin, tu allais à des endroits où tu n'étais jamais allé, que tu fouillais. Donc, cette, euh, cette, euh, cette énergie que vous mettez dans les, dans les après-cours, c'est ça qui, qui moi, est l'élément qui est le plus marquant. I can agree with that. Like Robin, <laughs> how do you know all this stuff, right? 
right? She's just yeah. amazing. Like, oh my God. You're going to stop the recording of this, right, Richard? <laughs> I, uh, yeah, no, I think it needs to be said because it's true. You're always so well prepared and the research that you both do um, is yeah. it's insane. I, I, I just like coming in. I don't always have a lot to say, but I like to hear what's, what uh, the conversations yeah. are. You're a good team. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. I mean, those are nice compliments. Thank you very much. And Mark? <laughs> well, thank you very much. Definitely. Thank you very much. But I, I, yeah. I also like bow to my fearless leader, like, <laughs> right? Okay. She, well, this is not what this part is supposed to be. Okay. This is just the embarrassing part. I, like, <laughs> I, I, I just say, well, thank you guys. I appreciate the accolade very much. Yes. <laughs> thank you guys. Yeah. I appreciate that. Mind boggling sometimes. Much. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, well, if I have to say, my sort of favorite parts of this is is discovering nuances and other traits. I chose to become a cook. I am a tradesperson, and if I could support my family on being a cook, I probably would. Whatever the path I chose as a cook led me here, which I don't regret, but. I chose to become a tradesperson and I love the trades. And what I really like doing is learning about the different trades and learning about nuance and learning about these different parts that influence the trades and finding those connections that weren't so obvious to me before that make me want to learn a little bit more each time. And so discovering the different trades and then having the trade teachers come in and add their, like, sort of either confirm or reject some of the stuff that I'm putting forward because sometimes I'm off, I'm off the mark. To hear teachers bringing that up, it's like, oh, okay, that's a different perspective. I want to hear more about that. So having the teachers come in and give their feedback on 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 these topics and 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 the way i'm presenting these topics and the way these topics can influence how we teach and how we prepare our students for the future i think is really interesting because when you break it down like there's three parts to teaching preparing teaching and evaluation like there's everything fits into those three parts right and at some point only so many times like i want to explain how to write a lesson plan <laughs> Right? Like at some point, it's just writing the lesson plan and the content that goes in it. Well, that's up to you, the teacher. But what I find is that all these elements that we're discussing help influence the way we teach our trade and the way that that the perspectives that we're giving to the students. And it's giving us a a way to maybe see it from a uh, see it from the student's perspective and how that might be something they're thinking about for the future. And not something that I thought about because that wasn't that wasn't an issue in my trade when it, when I started. You know? It's funny because I I I I, I sh kind of share what you're saying is that strangely by focusing on uh, teaching theories, uh, technological tool, learning tools, and on the specific away from the trades, it kind of brought us it brought me back to the true tradesperson nature that I have like uh, even though I'm not working in a trade right now I I'm a like I'm, I'm, I'm a product of the vocational ed for vocational training we called it vocational education back then but and it's and it's really how I uh, uh, can I say apprehend in the same meaning in French the, the brand, like I that I connect with the world it's true what people do with in what people produce in their work not it's mm -hmm. not a it's not a reflexive approach it's a hands-on i'm i'm providing a service i'm creating an, an mm -hmm. object that that's that's how i i understand the people the, the world around me and and going through the loop kind of brought me back to that and i like that very much that's going to be my next blog entry in my blog on the vt.proc nice. i have I, I, all i have right now is a title it's called vt pride <laughs> nice <laughs> vt pride <laughs> okay so the final part before we get to the uh get to the the tech inspiration um moving forward 
for the future. What are you thinking? Ideas, discussion points you want to see coming up, crazy stuff. Like I said, seven seasons in a movie, man. Maybe the uh, AI. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I'd love to thinking, see more on AI. I don't know how, how much we're allowed to do or talk about it. Or, yeah. <laughs> seems like it's taboo to mention it. So, yeah. We reached out to everyone. Yeah, we had a couple, we had somebody come back yeah. and say, let's, let's do more on, on this. Uh, yeah. What was it? Team building? Wanted to do team building one. Yeah. The notion of like forming a team. Yeah. I'd like to see what I was thinking would be kind of cool to see is like, I'm trying to put myself back as a, as a new teacher, like a, I'm, I'm starting out. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the subjects, although it's super interesting, it's too much for me. It's going over my head because I'm still in survival mode. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out the basic planning, piloting and evaluation, evaluation part. So I'm wondering if it might be cool to have like a, a new teacher corner, you know, where we talk about subjects that, would benefit new teachers that would situate that those early days of being a new teacher so that's something that's on my brain is a possible something for the future i agree i think you and i have had that conversation a few yeah. times right <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and there are a lot of new teachers yeah there are there are but yeah. then a lot of the the conversations like from these past 12 um episodes like you're right. It would be over their heads yeah. or not over their heads, but too much. It wouldn't to serve the need that exactly, they have right yeah, away. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Which is, I got to teach this. Yeah. Survival mode, right? Yeah. 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 Right. How do I make tomorrow's lesson interesting and yeah. get to keep the students engaged? And yeah, we can reach out to those new teachers. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They just need help, right? They, what's in here? How to put it down in an organized fashion <laughs> in yeah. a lesson plan? Peut-être aussi sur euh, les, les conseillers pédagogiques qui sont généralistes dans un monde de spécialistes. Moi, je trouve ça, c'est dans mon coin, il y a un centre qui a peut-être euh, 10 trades, puis il y a un conseiller pédagogique qui ne connaît aucun de ces mmh. programmes-là la, la, mènent à la, la pâte, comme vous dites, mais qui doit être celle qui va faire avancer ces, ces différents enseignants. Comment ça peut être difficile d'être accepté oui. et aussi de, de s'insérer dans ces équipes-là qui sont souvent si très serrées. Oui. Donc, je pense que ça peut être intéressant parce qu'on a beaucoup de conseillers pédagogiques qui, je pense, écoutent ou qui, se, qui sont présents, je pense. Oui. Yeah, that's a good point. So it's also like, yeah, going after more like here, here's the flavor of the trade pedagogical consultant so that it's a people so you just get a better idea of like, it's a little bit like what I was saying is like discovering the nuances of these trades. It's like, wow, okay, I might have more of a, a perspective because I am a trades person, but there's like, going after this stuff in healthcare is a wholly completely different ballgame <laughs> than the food world, right? And it's it's really interesting to see. Um, the notion of empathy, you know, and, and I see Ellen's down there. So hi, Ellen. And it's really Ellen that taught me how important empathy was in or is in the, 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 the healthcare sector. And, you know, it sounds obvious now, but back then I was like, uh, yeah, that's totally true. And it's just not something that exists in my trade. I never would have thought of that. And so that was you know, it's, it's really fun learning about that. And, it, and then it makes me understand a little bit better what, how do you bring that into an education system? How can I support this inside an education system? Like, I'm not going to suggest the same things for, for uh, auto mechanics as I am going to su su suggest for, for healthcare. It's, it's not, it's not the same entity. And I guess, like you were saying for Richard is we're so used to the education system being divided by subject matter. And, but yet, universal learning happening and this notion of UDL, so universal learning and vocational still exists, but how do you take that cultural element of a trade and plug that into the, the, the UDL model, which I think is, is that's the interesting part. And I think I find that that's 
kind of what I'm hoping to move forward with with the, the Voc Talk cafes. Okay, any other comments or do I hand it over to Mark for <laughs> I was we'll going to comment. Key takeaways. Yeah, well, I, my yeah, I'm I, I'm going to make a comment uh, before to anybody yeah. again to anybody who might be listening to the recording. Like every week, I post on social media what the next episode is going to be about. Shelly sends it to uh, the teachers, the educators in the sectors, to make sure that everybody knows. And every time we mention, uh, if you have an idea for an episode, if you have a topic you want to discuss, let us know. Because my dream for the Voc Talk Cafe is that Robin prepares a PowerPoint, I prepare a three-minute presentation on a tool, and if everything else happens by itself because it is owned by the people we yeah. want to serve and 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 it matches. It's like so if there's any anybody anywhere in vocational <laughs> training here in Quebec that's wondering, like damn, I'd like to think about to talk to discuss put whatever you want in the blank here, let us know. We'll set yes. it up with you. And, and, and all you have to prepare for is a short presentation, 10 to 15 minutes on a topic that you're concerned about and we'll take care of, and the, Robin and I and the other participants will take care of the rest and we'll all come out of it more um, enriched by what has been going on. Yes, here, That's here. dream for the future. That's your dream for the future? Yes. All right, I like that dream. <laughs> thank you <laughs> okay so our key takeaways from today so the discussion that bring up a lot of amazing avenues to explore and now that we have 12 done i have like 144 avenues that i want to go explore more about uh hearing the teachers takes is really enlightening and certain topics are like they're not just hot button topics but they're very rich and nuanced and we'll have more cafes to deepen that our understanding of that and like as a group to do it together it's not just about doing a presentation but it's like it's all those elements that we're bringing in about well how does this affect my perspective and what about these students and what about my reality and what about this and and, and that so 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 that'll be so that's a, a huge element for moving forward so mark you want to say your uh, mm -hmm. Usually at this point in the meeting, I bring up some tech tool of my back pocket that kind of relates to uh, what we've been talking about before. Today, I, <laughs> I want to bring to you the, the holiday wishes of James and myself. Have all the cookies in the jar. To, like, wish you tech that does what you want it to do in 2024 and a reliable and stable Wi-Fi. Enjoy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Reliable and stable Wi Fi. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this was a this was a this was fun. I like this wrap up. <laughs> Did you like this wrap up? Yeah, it was it's good. It's good. Yeah. Thanks, Kelly. Okay. So obviously to continue the discussion, don't discuss anything during holidays on this. You're on holidays. Let it rest in your brain. Okay. And it can wait until January. <laughs> but continue the discussion on vt.proceed.ca in the trade group. Um, respond to a discussion or, or, or start a new one. And if you need a hand, just use the little chat feature. I will be there. I'm not answering it during the holidays because you need to give your brain a break. Other than that, you can fill out the exit ticket form. Let us know how you like the Voc Talk Cafe and give us any feedback on it. Of course, let us know if you have an idea for the Voc Talk Cafe and you want us to talk about something in specific or help prepare, help you prepare something specific that would be very cool. And as usual, give us a contact. And I think that's it. Yes, I just put down in January 2024. See, I didn't forget, Richard. <laughs> but because we don't know what's going on, strikes, all that kind of stuff, back to our labor relations. We don't know what's going on. So we'll say we're coming back in January, but we don't know exactly when. Um, it's going to be on a Monday at three o'clock for sure. Monday at three o'clock. 